Here is Jason Bondin. I know him indirectly, personally, best through two of the things he's done, which are very, very important. One is being the editor of Red Herring magazine. And all the VCs and entrepreneurs um, have to see what Red Herring is saying about which companies are going to do well and which are not. I won't comment on their record of success in this prediction, but I can certainly say that given the choice, you'd rather your portfolio company was mentioned in Red Herring than that it was ignored. The other very important thing you've done, and I'm a big fan of yours there, is the MIT Review. It's a wonderful magazine, and I thoroughly enjoy reading it. And for those of us who absolutely cannot possibly keep track of everything that goes on in the world of technology, this is a very interesting way within an hour or two per issue of finding out a broad picture. So Jason Pondin, I finally discovered, and you know it's well hidden in your published CVs, that he has his qualifications basically are in cell biology. Mm. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that doesn't pop out of the CVs. It doesn't pop out of this thing. But here is a techie who, so to speak, did something about it and became an author and a publisher. In that capacity, he's written articles for all the best journals, like the New York Times and the Financial Times and the Boston Globe, but even more than all of those, I think, The Economist. That, to me, is the toughest nut to crack. So it gives me great pleasure to have, have him here. We admire his guts in coming, and uh, we look very much forward to hearing what he has to say. Jason Ponton, thank you. Good morning. I'm going to speak to you first this morning about some energy technologies. Though later this afternoon we'll be talking about technology reviews, selections for the top 10 technologies of this year. So I wrote this in Max Keynote, so it may not work on PowerPoint. So uh, patience if there are problems. So. Um, Technology Review has been published by MIT since 1899. Um, its editorial mission is a fairly simple one. It describes emerging technologies and explains their impact. And it reaches 2.6 million readers around the world with editions in Chinese, in English, uh, in India, in Italian, Spanish, French, German. And in addition to speak to your good selves, I'm actually here in Israel to explore whether or not we should launch a technology review Israel, uh, or a technology review in Middle East. Um, thank you. So you have to encourage me to do it, otherwise I shan't. So here is my contention for the day. Carbon is the product with energy. Um, the stuff we like, right, light, heat, combustion, they're just byproducts. And we'll never really get to truly efficient energy production if we keep on burning hydrocarbons. But there is really only one cheap source of alternative energy, it's, it's solar. I love this quotation, right? So we're bathed in these quantum particles that rain down on us from the sun, each of them carrying two volts of energy. Put it another way, 1,366 watts of energy strike every square meter of Earth every year. It's free, it's an enormous quantity of energy. But um, at least in the US, solar energy still constitutes only 1% of energy output, 1%. And the story is even worse than that, actually. The reason is mostly cost. Um, and in addition to cost, it's all subsidized. So let me, let me tell you a story. This is the largest solar facility in the United States. It's called the Exelon Solar City. And comically, it's been uh, built in Chicago, not the sunniest part of the United States. Um, there it is from the Earth. No snow there on that day. Um, so, largest solar urban farm, 32,000 panels over 41 acres. It's huge, right? Um, but the stimulus bill, this was uh, President Obama's stimulus package, in which $35 billion were aimed at energy alone. 
the stimulus paid for 80% of its $60 million cost. Um, it's never going to be profitable. It can never be profitable. It costs $6 a kilowatt hour to build. Um, you want to get around, around to 15 cents a kilowatt hour to be competitive with hydrocarbons. Um, and here's the great thing. It's only going to generate 10 megawatts of power for around 1,500 homes. So it, it basically doesn't work. Um, all solar power is subsidized. Solar power does not exist at the moment without government incentives. So the truth is we don't know at the moment how to build cheap, efficient, photovoltaic cells. And, and that's what we really want to go and do to get to, to, get to, get to free, clean energy. Even if we could generate cheap solar power, we don't know how to store it or transmit it. So this is an important feature. So people often talk about uh, solar cells as attractive. And in a sunny country like Israel, the idea of simply putting them on the top of uh, homes sounds attractive. But if we really want solar to be a grid technology, we need some form to store the energy at night and when it's cloudy. I swear to God, at the moment, the most common form of storing solar power is to go and pump water up a hill. Um, so if you pump it 100 meters up the hill, you essentially store 1,000 kilojoules for every meter um, of, of a gallon of water. It's not a very efficient way to go and store energy. Um, and once we have stored it, there's really no way to go and get the energy back onto the grid. So we need some breakthroughs. We need what my friend Bill Gates calls miracle technologies that create their own economic incentive and change the, the cost curve for solar energy. I'm going to very quickly, in the 15 minutes I have, talk about a couple of breakthroughs in solar power that I think might change the cost curve. So my number one breakthrough technology for solar power is called plasmonic solar. Um, it's slightly complicated, but let me explain what it is. At the moment, we have two ways of generating uh, solar power and photovoltaic cells. We can uh, create it very efficiently, but very expensively, on thick solar power cells uh, made out of silicon, or we can create it very, very cheaply, but very inefficiently using thin film uh, photovoltaic cells. What we would like to go and do is create solar voltaic cells in using cheap components on thin film, and you'd have the same efficiency. Plasmonic solar uses some of the properties of uh, wave light, uh, called plasmonics, to essentially trap a wave of light using nanotechnology in a thin film solar cell. Um, imagine a rubber ball entering a room and then bouncing around in it. That bouncing essentially lengthens the wavelength of light and makes it more efficient. This was created by one guy, essentially. Uh, his name is Harry Atwater. He's at Caltech. Just so you can bug him and ask to go and fund his technology, I've given you his, uh, his email there. But it's actually being um, uh, commercialized and worked on around the country at the moment. So this is the single technology that I think has the greatest chance of changing the cost curve of solar voltaic cells, though there are other people working on the power as a manufacturing problem. In China, They've tried to solve the problem by simply applying human labor to it. There's a company called Solar Tech that is using human la labor to go and create these cells very cheaply. And in Boston, there's an amazing company called 1366 uh, that's trying to go and improve the efficiency of solar manufacture. So there are, are other ways to go and create solar power. Um, you can do a thing called uh, thermal solar. Thermal solar is basically building gigantic solar plants, uh, usually in the desert. These are almost as expensive to build at the moment as nuclear power plants. They cost one or two billion dollars a year. It was the first generation of solar. You've probably seen these things. What they normally look like is a gigantic tower in the middle of a field. The tower collects energy that has been sent out from thousands upon thousands of mirrors in a field. Um, and it's incredibly expensive to produce because each one of those mirrors has to be created to an extraordinarily high degree of efficiency. Um, but what if you could do it 